I see Joe. I'm still floating in space. Now, uh, five o'clock. You may begin. Oh, okay. muted, Barbara. Okay, got it. Uh, good evening. It's uh, 5 p.m. on Tuesday, May 11th, and the City of Sugarlands Parks Advisory Board meeting is called to order. I am Board Chair Barbara Breshin. Uh, before uh, the, this meeting, uh, for those of you who are unaware, is live streaming on YouTube and it is also archived on YouTube following the meeting. Before we begin the, the business of the meeting this evening, uh, I wanted to let board members know that we have heard that former board member Sonal Buchar is being honored by Fort Bend Independent School District with a new elementary school being named after her. For our newer members, we were fortunate to have Sonal's wise, wise counsel and experience for almost five years before her untimely death in April 2019. Uh, in addition to being a uh, Fort Bend ISD trustee and, and the Parks Board member, she also served on many nonprofit and local organizations in our community. Uh, Sonal S. Uchar Elementary School is planned to open in Riverstone in January 2023. And now to our meeting. Uh, you all know that before we begin the meeting, um, we uh, I always remind everyone that you'll have an opportunity to make comment on all of the, the uh, presentations this evening and, and you'll be called on after each presentation is complete. Uh, has the city secretary received any requests from the public to make comment at our meeting tonight? No, Madam Chair. Oh, thank you very much. Hearing that there are no, uh, uh, there's no members of the public who wish to address us this evening, we'll move forward to item number three, workshop. Review of and discussion on an update on the hashtag all in for SLTX programs. Don Steff, Economic Development Liaison. Don. Good evening. It's so good to see some familiar faces from years ago. Um, tonight, I am here to talk about the All In for SLTX initiative, specifically the projects and programs that have a public art component. Um, so we started the All In for SLTX initiative. It was stemmed um, during the, can uh, the pandemic, and it was just an overarching way for us to do really cool things and do them quickly. Um, next slide. Here are some project um, funding criteria, but for y'all, it's mainly a public art um, component. So, so we will bring forward projects to y'all that have that art um, component to them um, for review. Next slide. So I'm not sure if y'all are aware, but we have an open call for projects right now that's ongoing. There is no, no deadline. Um, it's called the request for placemaking. Um, we have received several applications thus far that are either in the review process or have been approved for funding. Um, it also includes uh, two um, city-led projects that I will go over in greater detail. But as we get the applications and um, we have a committee that is set to review them 
and we make a case by case decision on if we're going to fund them or not, depending on if they meet the project goal, goals and criteria. Next slide. Our first project that we um, are, are going to fund, I'm sure you've heard of this. There was a couple of articles about it in the past week or two. Um, it is the Art Museum of Texas, and it is located in Town Square. They also have a location in La Sentara in Katy, if you have ever been. Um, it, so their budget is about $50,000, and we're using the Fort Bend County Fair, CARES funding to do this project. Um, they're going to feature Sugarland artists, but at a minimum, Fort Bend County artists. All art that is in the museum, it will be available for purchase. They're also going to sell some Sugarland branded goods as well. Um, so this is a project that is expected to open in late May. Um, so we are excited about that. It's We will let y'all know of the grand opening event that is going to be scheduled. I think it's May 24th, but I will clarify that and we will get y'all that information in case you would like to attend. Next slide. We have two mental health art projects. Um, we have partnered with two organizations. Um, our first organization is Partnership of Hope for the Day. We are doing three murals in three different parks in the city. Uh, two of the murals will utilize um, the slogan, it's okay not to be okay. Um, the image on the right is a mural that is in um, Denver, Colorado. So the messaging is standard. It will, it will stay that messaging. Um, but the background is what will change um, depending on the artist. We are utilizing, or we will be utilizing a local artist. Um, Suzanne Gray, who is on this call as well, is our new cultural arts manager. So she's the new Lindsay. Um, she is going to be working on identifying either one or two local artists who can help us design this mural. And once that is completed, we will bring that back for you. And just so you can see it prior to being installed in the three parks. Our goal is to have these installed prior to September. Um, it's Suicide Prevention Week, and so we want to promote it prior to that month. Next slide. The second project is a partnership with Two Right Love on her arms, um, and we will be stamping messages in concrete across the city. Um, we have a we have a committee that is trying to identify the five locations, and we're also identifying five alternate um, locations in the event that we want to um, do more than five. Um, it'll all depend on the budget on how many um, locations we can do. We have five statements that have been approved um, by city management, um, and you can read those five statements there. So there will be stamped into the concrete, and then immediately adjacent to them um, will be these art artesian um, wooden boxes that will be designed by local woodworkers and then painted by, um, by local artists. Inside that box will include um, some mental health resources and a QR code that people can scan, and it will take them um, immediately to um, the local, state, and national mental health resources. Um, and that will also be inc included in the mural um, at the city parks as well, that um, QR code. So if someone's there, they can scan that and get assistance if they need it right away. Next slide. Um, so we're also doing some pop-up improvements, um, and that has really spurred on um, the public art piece. Um, so we have, I believe it's more detail on the next slide, so let's go ahead and switch to the next slide. Um, there's an open call for artists that we have released, and Suzanne uh, has received 143 applications. That is amazing. Um, so it's all types of artists, from muralists to mosaics to sculpture. Um, so she, her and her team are reviewing those applications. It's, that is a monumental task. Um, and then they're also going to create a roster um, to which we can go to for any type of artists that we need um, and, and utilize them. So our goal is to take these um, artists and projects and pair them with a location in the city. So it could be a mural, it could be a light installation. Um, so we don't know yet. It's all unknown. But, um, but again, as we do the projects and um, have them ready to go, um, we will come back and update y'all on the location and what those um, art components will be. 
Next slide. And that was really it. So we're just doing really fun things. Um, if you know of anyone who would like to submit a request for placemaking application, please, please send them our way. And the link is on the city website. Um, we review on those applications like every week. So we are looking to do really neat, fun things that draw people to the city um, and also include a public art component. Any questions? Thank you very much, John. We'll uh, begin with uh, Kelly jo Kelsey Johnson. Kelsey, do you have any, any thoughts to add? Hi, Don. Thank you for the presentation. I just wanted to add a comment. I think it's a wonderful idea that you're using this opportunity to create a roster of local artists. And it's very um, strategic and smart and will only pay off in the um, in the future as well as we're seeking other public art installations that we have a database to, to go to and make sure that you know we're trying to hire locally. So I think that's a great idea. Thank you. And uh, Kelsey Lowe. Uh, I echo Kelsey Johnson. It's a really cool project. Um, my question is, how long is the Art Museum Texas in Town Square going to be open and available? We do not have a set time frame. Um, they said for a minimum of two years, so it could be two, it could be five. Um, so, but at a minimum um, for two years. Awesome. Thanks. Yes. Uh, Andy Fan. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> so, I love the idea of the Texas Museum coming in and um, looking forward to checking it out. And also love the mental health uh, kind of theme that's going on with the, I guess, three pieces or so. And um, looks fun. Can't wait to see it being implemented and installed. And also, uh, wow, you said 143 artists? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I like and that, that is um it's local and it's international as well so they're oh they're international all... too correct see i like the local but the international is great because it kind of pulls a little further out and kind of have like a satellite so everything between people from other you know displacements will come and check it out so it's great applaud that thank you okay uh tracy pipes I agree with everybody's comments, and I think this is a wonderful idea for our community. I uh, especially love the, the message that uh, the program's sending, and love that you're using local art, and there will be art for sale that's also a wonderful aspect to this, this program. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Kelly Reynolds. I agree with everybody so far and also wanted to say I especially like the concrete project. I think that's a really cool, uh, thoughtful way to, to approach that. Um, and also wondered, I couldn't see very well um, what the box is going to be. Is it one of those little library boxes or what are those? Um, so it is, it, so the picture is like a small um, library box. It's also going to be a lighthouse. So we're going to have lights installed so it draws you and attracts you to um, the box. And inside we'll have um, some mental health resources, but there will also be a QR code that takes you to a list of mental health resources as well. So we have it. So this is that just is, an example. It is not the actual boxes that we are installing. It's just an idea. And so we, um, we will be reaching out to the local woodworkers to design and create our own. So this, it may not look exactly like this, but it will be something close to it. That's an amazing idea. And I really appreciate you using the local woodworkers too. I think that's really nice. Very good. Thanks, Kelly. Yeah, Dawn, uh, it's amazing all the different uh, mediums and locations you're going to be using. So it's going to be pretty cool to be drawing people into our town square as well with the museum. And I'm real pleased to, to see that as well. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Uh, moving on to item four, director's report. Excuse me, workshop. Uh, review and discussions. I apologize, guys. I'm multitasking here and I'm losing my place. We are ready for the director's report. Um, parks topics, upcoming events, and a recap of April. Joe Chesser, director of Parks and Recreation. 
Good evening, uh, members of the board. Um, it's another busy month and a lot coming up uh, this month. Uh, kind of to just kind of touch on something that we met on here uh, a month or so ago was the extension of the trails at Brazos River Park, uh, the mountain biking trails, that is from uh, what we call Tower Run up at Brazos River Park near US 59 to connect to the Brindley Trail in Memorial Park. And you can see the picture here, William, with uh, four of the members of the Fort Bend Mountain Bike Association. They led a team of, of volunteers to go out and clear. It ended up being about two and a half miles of trail right now. And they'll come back in and do another kind of connecting loop uh, on those. But when this is completed, uh, they will be connecting those two trails uh, with a, you know, it'll, it'll expand our, our mountain bike trail opportunities tremendously. And I've had the opportunity to walk it along with William, uh, both when it was just flagged out for, for uh, our approval, the city's approval, and then once it was it did the rough clearing. And it's, it's really a beautiful trail. Uh, it winds pretty close to the high bank of the river. You can have some overlooks into the river area and it's very heavily wooded and it's nice shaded area. Uh, really nice. I know the bicyclists are really excited about getting onto it. Uh, we hope to have it totally completed and open in line with uh, the opening of the road and trail, which is planned for uh, pretty much any time now when the contractor gets uh, a few final items completed on the project. Uh, they've made a lot of headway down there. They've got a few kind of small but significant things to still finish before we can consider it completed. And um, we're also planning to do a ribbon cutting later on this month. It's scheduled for May 27th. I provide a little bit more information later on in the uh, presentation tonight. But uh, um, the gentleman in the middle with the gray shorts on is, is Ryan Stroll. He, he's, he's been on some of our parks board meetings and presented information to you. So uh, it's just turned out to be a really good partnership with them. They're doing a good job of, you know, main, making sure that they're meeting the requirements of the agreement that we, we worked so hard to, to put in place and, uh, you know, kind of following their social media and things. They're, they're really sticking to the, the spirit of the agreement. And uh, so we're, we're happy to be working with them on that. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a couple of more development and maintenance projects that we're working on. Uh, the image that you see on the left, hopefully you can see it fairly good. It's, uh, it's an overlay of a, a project we're working on. It's kind of the final uh, phase of development at the Brazos River Park from the original bond election from 2013. Uh, it might be a little hard to see, but what we're, we're showing here is uh, a picnic pavilion that would uh, be aligned off the axis with the uh, Overlook Plaza and then a playground behind it and then a walking trail that loops around that, the, the playground area. Uh, in the original planning for the Brass River Park, we had included a picnic pavilion and an area closer to where we were planning to do the Mid Lake project. But as everybody knows with the Brazos River erosion study going on and the concerns with, with erosion, um, we've decided to not expand that lake at this time until we've gotten more information through the engineers. But uh, we've got a great spot here at the park to be able to address those needs. And that's probably the biggest need that we need at Brass River Park right now is a shaded area. Um, you know, as, as, as those of you who attended the Kite Fest have known that, uh, it, you know, we have to bring in a lot of infrastructure when we do an event down there. So having a covered area to stage events out of, uh, as well as as a rental facility uh, for normal use uh, will be a great asset to the park site. This is a sketch that Fulman put together and you can kind of see, you know, she's, She's very talented, not only as a designer and project manager, but she's very artistic as well, kind of in keeping in theme of the, the meeting tonight. So um, 
from your sketches really present the projects very, very well. Um, at Cullinan Park, one of the ongoing issues of the park, and this goes back many, many years, long before Sugarland became involved in uh, working with the Conservancy on the park. It, it's the vegetation growth in, in White Lake. And it just, year over year, it just tends to get more and more aggressive. Um, and it's a mixture of various kinds of aquatic vegetation. It's not just one type of vegetation that's, that's really um, impacting the, the lake. So it, it's taken a, a pretty specific approach to how the lake is going to be treated. Um, William's done a really good job with working with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department's uh, aquatic vegetation management folks and the local um, lake management company that, that takes care of, you know, they take care of a lot of the HOA lakes and uh, other amenity lakes around, but they also are very capable of uh, managing a more a more natural lake like what White Lake is. So they've formulated a plan to um, provide some some spraying and vegetation control to try to reclaim some of the the you know more open water areas there at the park. Uh, and so in, in the summer, in, in the summertime is when the vegetation really grows and takes off. In the wintertime, when you go out there, when it's, when it's the winter, the cold has knocked back the vegetation. That's generally the kind of look we're trying to achieve more now with the, the aquatic vegetation control and working with lake management. So they just started. The, the vegetation is just starting to grow back as it starts to heat up. So it's a good time to start managing that um, that vegetation now. So lake management started last week uh, with some spraying and they also do some cutting as well. It's not just spraying, but it's cutting. But they're also being very cautious with the spraying to make sure we're not negatively impacting uh, the aquatic life in the lake and the fish. We don't, we don't want to end up with a fish kill um, uh, happening, you know, in, in, as a result of the spray. So, um, we're moving forward with that. We're really hoping for, um, uh, positive results from that spraying and, and having more open and visible water there at, at Cullinan Park. This is also a, a, an effort that is funded through the donations raised by the Cullinan Park Conservancy. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, on the left, this is uh, an interesting project that um, we're, we're looking forward to getting started on. As a city, our Mike Goodrum, our new city manager, has kind of challenged us to all the departments, not just parks, to come up with innovative ideas and then kind of submit those innovative ideas um, for consideration for funding. Uh, of projects. Um, William had seen a, a presentation on an automated trash collection robot. And so that's what you see in the picture is this robot. And it's a company out of Central Texas that has developed this and uh, is working with a couple of park agencies uh, in Central Texas. And we're looking at uh, doing a kind of a, a, a couple of year lease program on the equipment and they, through the lease, they set it up and maintain it. Um, and so we have it there in the park and we kind of watch over it. it it's a very heavy duty uh, piece of equipment and we're looking at uh, Eldridge Park because it's pretty wide open. There's a lot of soccer fields and we feel like it would be a really good place to put it to the test and see if it would work. So um, there's plans to go see it operate uh, with the city of Kyle uh, in Central Texas soon. So uh, we're going to see how that works and, and hopefully we'll be um, putting it in, into place here because unfortunately one of the real uh, 
drags on our manpower is just the amount of litter that they have to pick up in parks. It seems no matter how many trash receptacles we put out, it just seems like litter still just accumulates. Uh, and, and it's especially heavy at, at soccer complexes. Um, so that's why we decided to choose Eldridge as the pilot program for that. Um, the, the next slide or the next picture here is, um, uh, could you go back, go back one bit? Uh, we're working on a senior center needs study. Uh, the senior center has, has grown tremendously in, in each kind of generation that we've had of the senior center. It started in a very one room in our original old building where parks used to be. And then it grew to a bigger space in that building. And then ultimately it took over what was formerly the community center re rechristened as the TE Harmon Center. Uh, it's continued to grow. And certainly COVID's kind of been a, um, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's affected our, our, the growth of the, the facility. And now we're planning to open back up soon and we think the numbers will come back. So uh, we think they'll come back pretty strong. It might take a little while, but we've, we've had this needs study and we, in our planning, but due to COVID, we've kind of had to put it on hold and we've just done some other study like where it could potentially go or, you know, what's with some of the, the pros and cons of various locations around the city be, or should we leave it where it is? So we've, we've looked at other, other opportunities for where it could go, but we really haven't been able to get into the community input aspect of the needs study project because we felt like if we tried to do it during COVID, everybody's mindset would just be on oh, safety and, uh, you know, the concerns about how safe would people be there when they come back. And, and that's not really, we're looking at this as a very long-term kind of project. It may be uh, a number of years down the road before we even have a bond election to consider doing it, but we feel like it's a, it's a study that needs to be done now so we can plan ahead for the future. And so internally staff has been working on uh, uh, a survey to go out to targeted primarily to seniors, not just seniors that are members of the current center, but uh, other seniors that may not be attending this center and people in their you know 50s that are probably not really at retirement stage yet, but we'd like to get some input for what kind of you know, what kind of activities and, and environment they would like to be in with, when they have the opportunity to be in members of a, of a senior center later on. So we're kind of putting, putting the finishing touches on that survey now, and we'll be working through the city's communications department to get that out uh, probably in the next few months. Uh, we kind of want to get people back and comfortable and kind of just let, you know, everybody's getting vaccinated. Things are kind of slowly getting back to normal. Uh, we want to kind of get people back into the mindset of getting out and being and more active than they have been. So uh, look forward to, to getting that rolling soon. Uh, next slide, please. Kind of leading into that, uh, we've worked not only with our our own staff, but city management on what we think is a you know safe time to open up the center. And with vaccinations being out and available now and to the point of where pretty much anybody who's going to get vaccinated is at a very good opportunity to do that. Uh, we plan on opening the center back up on May 17th. Uh, that's next Monday. And we realized that you know, some people may still not be totally comfortable coming back. So we're expecting it'll be kind of a soft opening uh, in a way with uh, people kind of slowly coming back in. Uh, we do plan on continuing to require masks being worn in the building. Uh, that's still uh, uh, being done in city buildings, not just the Harmon Center, but other city buildings. Uh, so as long as that's still in place, we will plan to have people wearing their masks. Uh, we will try to maintain social distance and then continuing to do cleaning of surfaces on a regular basis. Um, um, 
and, and then, like I said, just kind of ease back into the programming there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, well, April probably didn't seem like a particularly rainy month. It seemed like every Friday in April there was severe weather warnings uh, every Friday that we had one of our food trucks uh, Fridays planned. So we ended up having to postpone them. We were going to have bands at this one, uh, you know, along with the food trucks. And as, as the as the weather warnings came in, some of our bands canceled on us and some of the food trucks uh, due to their need to prepare fairly uh, long in advance uh, postponed on us. So uh, what we've decided to do is reschedule those for uh, June. Uh, we're picking some dates in June uh, to, to continue the food truck series. Um, next slide. But kind of along the same lines as the as the food truck Fridays, we've started a new program called the Yappy Hour, which is a happy hour at the Palm Springs Dog Park. We held our first one last Thursday. Uh, it was a really beautiful day, and we had a really good turnout. There was a lot of folks there in the dog park, and uh, they came over and enjoyed eating out. Uh, St. Arnold's uh, Beer has continued to be our sponsor uh, of these these type of events and they provide um, free beer to us and we, we give two ticket two drink tickets out uh, to people who want to come and participate in the event um, you don't they don't have to buy food but the food trucks are there available and typically the way we do this is two regular food trucks and then a dessert truck uh, being there so we've got two more of those and so those will be every other Thursday here in here in May Next slide. Um, our traditional Memorial Day event will be held at Memorial Park uh, on the last Monday of May, which will be Memorial Day. And uh, this is an event that we look forward to every year. It's, um, it's a, we feel like it's a pretty touching event uh, for, you know, for, for veterans especially. And uh, we have, speakers and bands playing patriotic music and uh, just it's a, just a nice ceremony usually ends with a 21 gun salute and then we have a boy scout troop that raises the flags flags are have flown at half staff starting the in the, the pre-dawn hours and then raised at noon that day uh for memorial day so that'll be going on at sugarland memorial park we have a uh, we have a uh, shuttle bus planned for this and this will be our first opportunity to utilize the shuttle bus on the new road and people will be able to park at uh, Brazos River Park and shuttle back and forth to uh, Memorial Park uh, that day. So we're looking forward to that. Next slide please. Uh, before I kind of go to questions I just kind of got a couple of other things that I just wanted to touch on. Um, We've got the the pool, the city pool will also be opening on Memorial Day weekend and the Sugarland Sharks swim team that that has their home base at City Park Pool has already started there. They started April 26th and so they're out there swimming in the cold water uh, until it starts to warm up. And then uh, at the City Park tennis courts, slash pickleball courts. Uh, we're going to be holding a uh, pickleball tournament uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, we've got all the slots filled for the tournament and uh, this will be the first pickleball tournament that we have held and so uh, we're glad to see that it's it's popular uh, with those wanting to attend it and we, we, we hope to be doing more of that in the future. If you're not familiar with pickleball, it's, it's uh, it's kind of a little bit like tennis, a little bit like table tennis, but you're actually standing there playing. The court's not nearly as big as tennis. It kind of started out with more like retirement age people playing it, um, but it's also catching on with, with younger people now as well. So uh, just kind of a growing activity. We also we offer pickleball indoors at the rec center on Thursdays, but then we also have the outdoor courts striped at City Park and so they share the court area with uh, uh, 
tennis tennis activities. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about things that are going on. Thank you very much, Joe. Uh, we'll begin with board member Kelsey Johnson. Kelsey? Thank you. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, I noticed in your director's report the written copy that we got and then also reading up in the Fort Bend Star paper, I think it was, about the mayor's uh, monarch butterfly pledge. I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit about that and maybe if there were any plans to um, encourage residents to also, you know, plant uh, pollinator friendly gardens in their spaces as well. Yeah. Yes, that was a, um, when that kit was presented to us, we looked at, uh, this was a, a national organization that uh, uh, kind of leads the, the mayor's pollinator pledge or a monarch butterfly pledge. So we looked at the requirements in it and we've already, we're already doing a number of those things. Uh, we've got a butterfly garden at Memorial Park that utilizes volunteers. Uh, a lot of volunteer labor. Our um, our last two parks department volunteers of the year were were worked worked at the uh, the butterfly garden. Both high school kids, and and so that was um, it, it's got signage there that kind of explains the value and benefits of doing pollinator plants. We also, uh, as part of ongoing projects. For reforestation at the Brazos River Park and Memorial Park, we've done some fairly extensive wildflower seeding there. And the, the wildflower seeding also with the intent of, of attracting pollinators or pollinator plants or pollinator species to the plants. Um, and those have, uh, it, it takes a while to get those plants up and growing and reseeding. And as they reseed each year, they start, start to spread more and more. So, we're seeing more and more of our, our the, the, the fruits of our labor down there. And those are also, we've, we've held some seeding projects that were volunteers. Uh, we had um, uh, a group of girls, uh, junior service league girls that uh, helped pollinate do the seeding a couple of years ago during our, uh, our trees over sugar, or trees across Sugarland program with Keep Sugarland Beautiful. So. It's a, it's a it's a program that continues to grow. Uh, we're also trying to incorporate pollinator plants even into some of our right of way landscaping projects. Holland working on some of those. Um, as far as trying to encourage more people to do it, we're just hoping that as people see the the garden out there, we'll take interest and we'll look into it. All a lot of the nurseries, especially the the more local nurseries like uh, Enchanted Gardens are starting to, um, you know, sell more and more pollinator plants. And they, they've started selling milkweed, which is the most necessary monarch butterfly plant. And uh, so, I, and, and in reading about that, I know that there's, I've been reading that they sell out each year. So I know there's more and more people that are starting to, to, to take notice of this and, and wanting to be involved in it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kelsey Lowe. Uh, all kinds of great stuff. Looking forward to seeing things coming up in the future. Um, I just have one question about the trash collection robot, mostly because it it just seems so neat. Um, is it basically like a giant Roomba kind of scooting around sucking up trash? That was that was kind of my my thoughts too when I was kind of asking about it. William, you, you you're probably the most knowledgeable of it if you want to chime in yes sir it's a it's a mecca works um and he's from uh, the south austin area i think i'm really eric kyle area uh, city of kyle and city of san marcos both use the mecca works robot and it is like a large roomba but it's it's almost like a lawnmower size it's it's so it's quite big so but it operates similar to a roomba i would say it more operates similar to your pool vacuum if you have a pool vacuum especially if you have a newer polaris vacuum that's plugged in um it, but this one's battery powered, so it's going to be plugged in by my staff every day. We're work there. MechaWorks is working very hard at modifying this robot. So, like the Roomba has been modified, and the pool vacuum has gotten better and better every year. Um, also, more expensive every year, but it's gotten better and better every year to where the Roomba like now we like charges itself. MechaWorks is working on getting the robot to like charge itself. But 
the MegaWorks robot has a lot of other challenges. Terrain, people, uh, landscaping don't pick up um, don't pick up soccer balls, but you need to pick up bottle caps. So, um, so uh, with the robot teaches the robot has cameras on it that te and it teaches itself with our help what to pick up and what not to pick up, and then it has a GIS program that gives it a map. So we don't like the like the Husqvarna and the steel lawnmowers that are now mowing people's yards. They have to have a perimeter fence, like wire put into the ground around the entire yard to keep the, uh, the mower inside your yard and not the neighbor's yard. Um, this robot doesn't need that. We're gonna give it a GIS map of Eldridge Park and it's gonna stay in Eldridge Park and not go in the pond. Probably not go in the parking lot because because of the vehicle situation, we've got to figure that out. Um, and then we probably won't do all 50 acres because I think the limit right now on a robot is like 12 acres a day. But most of the trash in Eldridge Park is in only certain areas, the common areas, the playground area, the pavilion area, and, 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 and we're trying to really stay focused in that area. And then once we learn more about the robot or get a second robot, then we can maybe expand it a little bit. But it's Mecca works, and uh, he pretty much makes them from scratch. Um, he pretty much hand builds them. Uh, he's a smaller company, but he is looking at, 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 at obviously getting more cities interested. And the more cities they get interested, the, the bigger he can become and the more robots he can make. But uh, Jason Lewis is a great, great guy. He's been very responsive. And uh, the innovations panel just loved, loved the idea. And so and they're funding it. So that's the fun part. So um, the idea is to get Eddie, my crew chief Eddie, uh, you know, a 20 year veteran, 15 year veteran to stop picking up as much trash and have him go do other park maintenance work orders that he is more capable of doing than picking up trash. And it's just, we followed Eddie out at Eldridge Park the other Monday, the innovations team came out and we followed Eddie around and tracked all the, all of the trash he picked up and followed him for like an hour and a half. And then we put it on a map and you just wouldn't believe all the little times, all the little bitty pieces of trash that he had to pick up and how time consuming it was to pick up all these little bitty pieces of trash all over the park. And so when I explain to people like how much money this could potentially save us, plus it's cool. I mean, people just jumped on, on people are just loving this idea. So, and then the idea would be, of course, hopefully the pilot goes well and we get more robots in the future. So, hope that answered okay. it. Yeah, that's pretty neat. I'm gonna go look at it Friday. Friday, me and uh, the innovations team, we're gonna go look at it in Kyle, Texas and actually see it operate. But if you type in MechaWorks on YouTube, there's a video that pops up that kind of shows how it works. It's really cool. But I'm hoping to take some more pictures and some video of it Friday and maybe show y'all in the next Parks Board meeting and eventually show y'all a video of it actually working in our Eldridge Park, hopefully soon. The question was, did it operate at night? Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't catch that question. <laughs> um, I asked that question and it can operate at night, but uh, it can operate in the parking lot at night because it, the photo, the cameras need light to see the trash. So it can operate in the parking lot at night. Um, so eventually we might get it to operate at night in the parking lot only. But it needs, I think it needs, um, it needs, um, it needs to be plugged in by my staff usually. And then they need to plug it in at when they leave. And so when it auto charges, I'm hoping that we could get it to auto charge and then go out at night, like midnight and pick up trash in the parking lot. That might be later down the road, but I know because the parking lot is lit, but it, it can't really operate in the grass, I don't think, at night because it needs the photo cameras use light to see the trash and identify it as trash. And then it puts it, it picks it up and puts it in this hopper and this belt, and the belt carries it to the back of the machine into the hopper in the back. Um, but the good news is our Eldridge Park is really busy, you know, after five o'clock when my guys are leaving for the day because that's when the soccer people are starting to come out and, and play soccer. And the, the the trash robot can recognize somebody and go around it. There's the YouTube video shows that. So I'm not, I don't have any concerns that it's going to be a dangerous robot. Um, but the, when it operates with less people, the less time it has to stop and go around people and stuff. And that's, that's when before five o'clock. And then that's about when my guys are going to be plugging it in and emptying it out at the end of the day. Thanks, William. That's going to be great fun to watch. Sounds like a field trip. Uh, Andy Fan. Yes, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> yeah, just to piggyback a little bit, just I don't want to spend too much on the robot, but it's very cool. It reminds me of the security robots that we have in downtown where it just goes around and has a set path and, you know, people can re remote into it. 
and it's fun. A lot of people are probably going to take pictures and selfies and stuff with it too. So it's a, an attraction. It's an art piece moving around collecting trash. Um, the other thing was uh, I was very impressed with the drawing that was <laughs> done with the landscape that's over the uh, over the lookout in um, the Crown Festival. That's going to be real nice to see once it comes to fruition. And then uh, I guess the whole thing with the uh, what do you call it? The Cullinan Park or so. I remember going there with family and seeing that collective of the water, I guess the, the surface area and how, how it's very thick. And I, I guess like we'll see how it goes with opening up, whether we want it to open up or, or thicken it up. I think it's nice to see that too. But everything seems fine. Can't wait to see the, uh, with, with the, the events and everything that comes up, especially the Memorial, uh, the Veterans Memorial weekend. I think it'll be great to have that festival. Uh, it's always a great family kind of gathering and people of Sugar Land, it's always nice to to have that, to kind of visit and see each other again. And that's about it. Thank you. Thanks, Andy. Uh, Tracy Pipes. Um, I appreciate all your comments. One of the things I'm super excited to see are the events uh, and how many more events that y'all are planning in Sugarland because I think everybody's really ready to do things and um, and I'm also excited to see the senior center opening up again because I mean I bet they're just ready to do something too uh, since the, the vaccinations and everything is happened so I uh, really appreciate everything and y'all keep yeah. up. Thanks. Thanks Tracy. Uh, Kelly Reynolds. So um, it's funny, I recently had a resident talk to me about how much uh, trash there is at the tennis course that she uses. And she was talking about the bins overflowing and she wishes that there were recycling bins that were you know, clearly marked. She said, number one, for the tennis ball cans, so for metal, and then secondly, for people's water bottles. Um, and so, you know, I started thinking about it. I thought that might make a cool kind of public engagement project, even for kids to kind of help make signage. And I don't know if y'all have room for more recycling bins near the courts, but from what I hear, they really need them. And, um, you know, a lot of people would appreciate them not, you know, people not throwing things directly into a trash can, but having recycling possibilities there. So thank you. Thanks. We'll get to it. Thanks, Kelly. Well, I will say that our, sister, our city is really coming out of the pandemic in a really wonderful way. And thank you all for all the activities you've got. I'm really looking forward to Memorial Day. Uh, I might even try the yammy, the yappy hour. Uh, borrow somebody's dog and head over to the, to the Palm Park. Uh, There's no dog required. Yay. If you don't your dog, no dog uh, required. Uh, my dog, Joe. She can borrow my dog, okay? <laughs> Okay. And then also having the food truck um, in June. I think that's going to be great. And I'm also noticing that the Smart Financial Center uh, is getting active again and starting to schedule. So our city's really coming alive. It's pretty cool. Did you well, want to ask really, Ho Jin? Did you want to go to Ho Jin? Uh, Ho Jin said that he um, arrived rather late and he would uh, pass for now. Yeah, my apologies. Uh, I had to work thing, so, but I showed up. Hello. <laughs> oh, Jen, it looks like you're in the mountains. Are you sure you're, you had a work thing? I'm in Colorado. Oh, no, I'm kidding. This is a, uh, Colorado Springs I took years ago. Uh, it's a picture of mine. Oh, it's lovely. Really nice. Well, uh, as we have no further business before us this evening, do I have a motion for adjournment? Anyone? I'll make a motion. All right. Thank you, Andy. Is there a second to Andy's second. motion? Oh, thank you. Uh, and with a raise of hands, I'll agree with that motion. Okay. Motion approved. And our meeting of May 11th is adjourned. Thank, thank you. you all. Bye. Sorry, guys. Yeah. Thanks. Have a good night. Good night.